Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are joining us today for this third webinar in our series of step-by-step -step, the HIG FEM verification trail. So today's session is on water use. I look forward to engaging with all of you in the next one hour on talking about the impact area in HIG FEM, which is on water. Before we go on, Please let me introduce our organization to you. Leadership and Sustainability is spearheaded by our CEO, Ms. Karen Egberg. She has had a long experience in the sustainability area in different organizations before establishing leadership and sustainability. So we are a young company, but with a lot of experience. And we have been in, involved in many different projects in the supply chain, basically on materiality assessment, on strategy development, chemical management implementations. And also would like to mention that Karen has been awarded the HIG Index Verification Leadership Award in SAC in Barcelona in 2019. A bit about myself as well before we go on. I'm a textile technologist with over 20 years of experience in the textile safety and in the consulting domain. I'm a lead auditor for 14,001 and 45,001. And here in the markets, I have been a climate action plan 2.0 assessor as well as a sustainability awards assessor with the CII. I'm currently a member of the ZEHC Academy Steering Committee. And with leadership and sustainability, I work in the capacity of a HIG FEM verifier or trainer, a BPI consultant, a ZEHC trainer, and a BRM verifier. So let's get on with our session today. And before we go on, I would like to just give you a brief of how we will be interacting with each other. We will be doing it via this particular panel, that is the Zoom platform. And here I would like to request that all of you put in your messages if required via the chat function to maybe communicate with me. But if you're putting in any technical questions, I would request you to put in the questions via the question and answer panel here on your screen. So you will see uh, on the Zoom control panels, a Q and A section. And that is where I would request that you put in all of your questions. But on the whole, yeah, this is the Q&A panel, and this is where you would write, you would require to type in your question, and you can send that. And please avoid putting it in the chat function. We might miss it, so that is, that is why this particular request. And of course, in a follow-up email, you will be provided with a link to the recording as well as the slides, which you will be able to download for your own internal use. And also, before we go on, I would just like to bring your attention to the fact that all of this material is copyrighted with Sustainable Apparel Coalition and with Leadership and Sustainability. So please do use it for your own internal training and other purposes, but kindly refrain from sharing it outside of your organization. Let us go to the agenda for today. In this agenda for today, we will be looking at the verification trail and its purpose. We will cover section four, which is on water. We will have some examples of how we will utilize water in our organizations. How can we optimize the water usage? We will have some time for questions and discussion. And finally, at the end of the session, we will give you a training and verification offer that we would like to make to all of you who are gathered here today and a bit about leadership and sustainability and the entire team involved. So that's what we would be going on in our agenda. Coming to the verification trail and its purpose. It is in order to gain a better understanding of the HIG index and FEM in particular, 
the meaning for your specific organization. So you would be aware that the Hege FEM has a lot of applicability questions. And for each individual unit, when we are talking about the environmental impact, it is going to be different. And this is what we would want each of you to understand and take away and get inspired to improve your, your environmental performance on the whole. So what we will be providing is a section-wise guidance through all of the processes that are required, how you would require to get acquainted with the requirements in Hige FEM your, based on your applicabilities. And in this trail, we have covered in the last two webinars which were conducted, we have covered sections one and two which was on the facility information and permits and environmental management system. And the third section, which was on energy and GHG. So this is what we have covered so far. Yes, I could see a message here. You will receive a link to the sections one and two, and that is in this, in this particular presentation itself. So in this presentation, presentation on the last slide, we have given you the links where you will be able to access the previous webinars just in case you have missed it. So thank you for that. And coming to the verification process, we would like to give you a small guidance on how you would be able to conduct the verification process at your each of your facilities. So firstly, for the verification, you would require to complete the self-assessment. Next, you would require to engage a verifier, that is, you would require to provide information of your facility, what is the type of facility, what is the number of employees that you have, whether you have chemicals in production, what is the level of chemical that you have reached in your module, uh, what is, whether you have an ATP plant on site, what is the actual location of your facility. So based on all of these details, the verifier would then make a proposal for your organization. You would then require also to make the self-assessment and the VFEM available to the verifier. So these are separate modules. Your self-assessment is one module and your VFEM is another module. So you would require to make both of that available to the verifier. The verifier then reviews all of the documents and informs you of any issue that he sees beforehand. Let's say certain documents are missing or maybe he wants a certain other information, all of that will then be checked with you prior to his coming on site for the actual verification. He will send you the, he or she will send you the agenda for the on site or off site visit. And then there are two types of verifications which can happen. You can have the on site verification where the verifier will actually be on site and be understanding your processes and your your equipment etc so that he would be able to give you a bit more information you also have the facility of doing an off-site verification wherein it is a desktop verification wherein we will be asking of course to see the facility perhaps as a video review we would request that one of your team members can take a video shoot and show us the entire facility over the video. But of course, there are limitations to the off-site verification. And on basically for the SAC, they recommend that if it is an on-site verification which has happened, then you are able to share this mod externally and also maybe on your website, on your sustainability report, for example, or an, in any kind of communications that you bring out to all of your stakeholders, you are in a position to share that. But if it is an off-site verification, you can of course share it with your brands and with, with other maybe upstream suppliers or down, downstream suppliers with whom they are requesting, when they are requesting for the HIG FEM shares but you will not be able to communicate this publicly. So that's the difference between an on-site verification and an off-site verification. And finally, you would have to, once the entire verification is complete at your end, you will have to report the results or you will have to post the module on the HIG-FEM platform. 
this is these are the seven main steps that happen when verification is happening at your facility and we have here also provided you with a link where you will be able to go and understand a bit more about the verification before it actually happens at your facility and just a bit of general advice when we are talking about the hig fem our recommendation is definitely that you appoint one person who is responsible for all of the answers that are provided on the platform you would appreciate that there are many different sections you have sections on ems you have sections on energy water wastewater air uh, chemicals etc i know the questions are are quite quite detailed and intricate and it might be difficult for one single person to be to be understanding and reporting everything but he can be overall responsible for it so you might have a bigger team who is looking after maybe the entire chemical section you might have a team who is looking after the entire energy section so it is this person who is responsible for the platform should have an overall oversight so that he is aware if there are any changes that are being made in the, uh, fem as you are reporting it on the platform uh, here we have also given you links to the how to hig guide this is a wealth of information which is available on how you would require to report on the uh, hig fem and also the verification pre preparation guidance document is provided here you would require to respond of course accurately to all of the questions the documentation has to be extremely detailed when you are answering certain questions because this is the evidence that you are providing to let us say the environmental team that you have maybe the the water that you are reporting the energy that you are reporting so the documentation has to be extremely controlled and also accurate you would require to report on your targets and baselines and here we have to be aware of the time that will actually be required to report on uh, on the entire hig platform please factor in a period of at least about 4 weeks time so that you know that you have to collect a lot of data you have to review the data you have to understand if all of the information that you are providing are in sync with whatever is the information going out perhaps you are a group company and you have many different ancillaries you would require to also ensure that the messages that are going out may be in different platforms maybe your okotex step platform your hig fem platform or your pi platform they are all harmonized this is just a general advice and we would request that you do have all of this that we are recommending when you are going ahead with your hig fem and the ultimate goal finally when we are looking at reporting on any sustainability platform is the fact that we are able to improve year on year so this is the goal with which we are looking at reporting on a different sustainability platforms and now it's time to continue on the trail here you can see an overview of all of the different sections that are included in the hig fem module and today we will go into the fourth section which is on water use so in hig fem we understood that, you know there are certain sections which have applicability and there are certain sections where for example you don't have any kind of applicability if you're looking at environmental management system this is applicable for all facilities if you're looking at energy and energy this again is applicable for all facilities uh, but when it comes to water use there are certain applicabilities and in today's section we will deep dive into what are the requirements when we are looking at water from a hig fem perspective and you will also appreciate when we are looking at water that it was since since december of 2020 that water futures started to be traded on the new york stock exchange so whatever resources are available here on earth are limited and as responsible businesses and individuals 
it is our responsibility to try and mitigate whatever is the risk that is there for our operations. And all of the questions that are here in HIG FEM, they are actually structured to guide us to conserve and improve the, the impact that is that is there in each of our facilities. So in in this particular section, in the water use section, this is what we are trying to look at and improve. Let's take a look at this particular section. Fresh water basically has always been a very scarce resource in our planet. If you if you look at the data that is available, 97.5% of all water is basically seawater or brackish water. And 75% of the other 2.5, which is there, which is the fresh water, is basically tied up in the form of glaciers. So this makes only 0.625% of all the water which is available globally, available for use for, for the organizations and individuals. That is why it is extremely important that as a resource, when you are looking at water, we are able to look at all of the risks, we are able to conserve and utilize it to the maximum. Um, this, for example, is, an, is a water withdrawal map, which, is, which was presented by the UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Programme. And it shows the percentage of all available water that is used in 1995. So this is the actual map of 1995 and the projection that was made for 2025. So you can see here that, that there, there, were, there were many sections which were there in 1995, which were indicated as in orange color where your water withdrawal is more than 40%. The yellow sections are where it is 40 to 20%. And then you have the blue and the dark blue sections. So there are certain areas definitely world over where the water is, is the water withdrawals are going into the red category. And this is where we have to be mindful of. We have to understand what is the actual location where we are. How, and how do we improve upon the water usage with different actions that we are able to take? HEC-FEM basically for evaluating the water risk gives us two options. So you have the WRI aqueduct filter and you also have the WF water risk filter. Both either of these two risk filters can be utilized. If you are use, utilizing the WRI aqueduct filter, you will have to go in and put in the coordinates of where you are actually located, where your facility is, is actually located. And based on that, you will be then in a position to, to understand what is the risk that is there for your particular facility. If it is the WWF water risk filter that you would like to utilize and a report on on the HIG FEM platform. Here you have to actually register yourself and then you will be able to understand what is the risk that is involved. So these are the risk filters which are available. And this is basically one of the applicability questions. So depending on where you are actually located, let us say you are located in an area which, is, which has very low water risk, that is one of the applicability question. And the other question that, is, that comes upon for applicability is whether you are a heavy water user or a light water user. HIG FEM classifies you as a heavy water user if you are using more than 35 meter cubed per day of water uh, for your entire operations and for your facility. So in this case, again, you will be completing the entire HIG FEM water section. If you are a light water user and you are located in, in an area where you have extremely low water risk, then you are posed only question number one, which is on tracking. Uh, 
So this is the applicability that is that is there on the platform, which we need to understand. And here again, we have given you a link to how you would be able to go to the scoring and you know, understand what is applicable for you and what would be, how you would be scored for the water section. Coming to the use level. So we understood from, from the questions that the flow of the questions in the energy, water and waste sections are similar because in HIG FEM, these are the three sections which you have a possibility for continuous improvement. In water also, the level one questions, similar to how we had seen the energy section, they are the tracking questions. So here we are expected to report on what, how do we track uh, water that's coming into the facility. Level one is scored at 25 points for all facilities. Level Level one is scored at 25 points for facilities who are answering the entire HIG FEM section. So let's say you are a facility which is in an area where you have low water uh, risk and you are using less than 35 meter cube per day. You will have only level one question which is scored then at 100, 100 points. This is how the scoring is differentiated for different facilities. Your standard scoring is level one is at 25 points, level two is at 50 points, and level three is again at 25 points. So your level two are all of your baselining questions. What are your water intensive processes? What are the targets that you have set? Whether you have demonstrated improvements, whether you have a plan in place for improving your water usage, etc. All of these questions will come under your level two questions. And finally, you have your level three, which is going above and beyond what are your actual requirements. So here you are required to have a water balance equation, which has been performed for your facility. And we will explain that as we go ahead. So these are the three levels, and this is the scoring of how we will, we will be scored on the water section based also on the applicability that that the facility is undergoing. So the requirement here, you have to select all sources of water for your facility. What is the source? What is the quantity of water? What is the method to track your water source? It could be invoices. For example, if you're tracking, trying to track your water source, it could be invoices. It could be estimates. It could be actual water meter readings and logs, which are doing or it could be even an online monitoring system with the help of which you are a real time monitoring system with the help of which you are able to say yes on this particular day this is the usage that we have had from let's say the municipal water and let's say you are tracking two or three different sources perhaps you have both groundwater as well as municipal water usage then you would require to report for each single source you would require to report how you are tracking it what is the frequency of the measurement what is the what is the quantity of water that you are taking from each of those sources and also any type of additional comments so here let's say you have just started a new source and you want to say that this has been only a month since we have started utilizing this particular source of water maybe you have had a well which with the help of which you are able to extract groundwater and use them and perhaps you have got the permit now you can then say that yes it has started from this particular month in that particular cadence cadence year this is how you would require to to report on the tracking of the water sources so the intention here at the first level is that you are able to understand the what is the source of water that you are actually using you are able to then set performance indicators for each of the sources you are able to then identify let's say if there are if you are using the water where exactly is the water use are you are you having any types of leakages are you able to completely measure 
water, fresh water footprint, as we call it in the water management system. And here again, you will receive full points if you are completely tracking all of the sources of water that your facility is using. And you will receive partial points if you are completely tracking at least one of your water sources, but are not yet tracking all of your water sources. So this is what we need to understand for the tracking of the water. And basically, again, the platform will automatically convert your water usage data into common units, that is liters and percentage of total use. And this information will be used to auto calculate average daily usage to determine your applicability. So based on what you report, if you are using less than 35 meter cubed of water per day, then you will be classified as a light water user. And if you're using more than 35 meter cubed per day, then you will be classified as a heavy water user. As even if, if you are a, a heavy water user and if you are located in an area where you have very low water risk as per WRI, you will still be expected to complete the entire questionnaire. So only is, if you are both a light water user and located in, a, in an area where you are classified as with low risk, low water risk, only then will, will you come under the first applicability criteria. And before we go ahead, since we are talking about water meters, it might be good for you to also understand some of the flow metering best practices that are followed. When we are talking about metering, for example, we would require to install, uh, in order to understand our usage, definitely you can have usages in different levels. So the first level is where you're looking at the entire facility. The second level is where you are looking at the individual departments, which is utilizing your water. That is your second level of of information or the detail that you are getting from the water usage. And the third level is where you're looking at individual machines per se. Let's say you have both dyeing, you have printing, you have covering, you have bleaching, etc. You would then want to understand each of the departments, what is the usage of the water that, that's happening. So that's your third level of, of metering that you will do. So when you're doing your metering, you will have to look at areas where you will be able to install the water meter. Ideally, uh, you should install a sediment trap or a filter before the water meter is installed. So that let's say there, is, there are any kind of sediments, there are any kind of particles, etc. These are all captured by the filter. You should also involve a check wall to prevent the water from flowing backwards uh, through the water meter. This is again a good practice that we should follow. And as there is also a rule of thumb that is followed for pipe lengths, you should have at least 10 pipe dias in pipe length before the water meter and at least five pipe dias in pipe length after the water meter for a good, for a good installation of a meter. For example, if you are having a 1.5 inch pipe water meter, you would want 15 inches of the straight pipe before your water meter and about 7.5 inches of straight pipe after your water meter in order to have an ideal installation. So this is in order to achieve a maximum accuracy. And if your straight pipe length before and after the meter is less than this, the water will still, the water meter will still be accurate, just not as accurate as if you will follow the rule of thumb. So this is something that we would like to share with you. And coming to baselines, this is your question number two on the platform. So question number one was your level one. We now go to level two, where we are now going to be talking about baselining. And we have done this also for the energy section. So let me take you through how we will do baselines for the water section as well. So the question here is, has your facility set baselines for water use? And here, if you, are, if you say a yes, you have to select all of the water sources for which you have set a baseline. 
the intent here is that it is important for you to to know what is your starting point so you could have chosen perhaps the year 2019 as your baseline year or perhaps 2020 as your baseline year so that yes it is from this point onwards that we want to start our improvement journey during the verification you will be asked to explain also how the baseline was calculated was it absolute was it normalized what is the unit of measure etc will will also be checked and there are again two types of baselines that we would like to explain one is of course your absolute baseline which is which is the actual value of whatever is the meter reading that you have for a particular year so again i would just like to highlight that in hig fem when we are reporting any type of data the data is from the 1st of january in 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 this particular cadence we are going to be talking about the 2022 cadence so it will be from the 1st of january 2022 to 31st of december 2022 so uh, this is the data that we are expected to report and if you are talking about absolute reporting then you're going to talk about the actual value that you have for the water usage when you're talking about normalized you're taking a variable that you have and it is completely up to you as to how you would like to take the variable let us say your water usage is mainly affected by the number of people who are there in your organization then it can be it can be you can normalize your your water usage by dividing the total quantity of the water that's used for that particular year divided by the number of people that you have and perhaps also by the number of days that you have actually worked so that is one way in which you would be able to normalize and here you would have to report also on the units as to how you have reported let's say your water usage is mainly affected by the total production that is happening in your facility in that case you will have to take the total water usage for a particular year and divide it by the production volume that you are reporting on the platform so again the production volume can be in different units you can have it in kilograms you can have it in meters you can have it as number of pieces of products that you have finally sold or the final sam value that you have that you are declaring on the platform this is how we would be able to report on the water use and let's go ahead so here we have also an example of how you would be able to report on the water baseline okay i have a question here what is sam sam stands for a standard allowed minutes so this is also an a variable please check up our webinar that was conducted on section 1 where we talked about facility info and permits where we talked about standard allowed minutes and how you would be able to calculate the standard allowed minutes sam basically takes into 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 account any kind of variable it could be the complexity of the product it could be the time that's taken to make a particular so we have also given some examples there so you can cal you can go back into that presentation and check that out uh, okay coming to the normalized water baseline example in here you can see what is the total water consumption we have two so we have two indicators one is the municipal water and one is the well water that was utilized by the facility so this is the total quantity that was reported for a particular year so here is the total production for that particular year it was 1 million pieces of textiles it could be anything it could be perhaps denim jeans that has been produced by the facility it could be it could be the total pieces that have been reported but here what is important is that please ensure that it is the quantity that you are reporting on the platform this is your production quantity here and the calculation then will be the total of whatever is the water usage divided by the production 
and here you can have you can see it as 0 0.04 this is the total normalized water usage per piece of of product shipped so this is one example and this is your normalized water usage and if you're looking at baselines for individual sources your baseline for municipal is 0 0.02 and baseline for well is again 0 0.02 when we are looking at what is the total meter cubed per piece for each of the source so i hope you have understood how we come to the calculations it is completely up to the facility how they would like to choose the way in which they would like to arrive at the baseline because it could be your variability factor could be more relevant with the number of people who are working there with the number of with the number of days that you have actually worked or it could also be the production quantity which is which is relevant for you so it is up to you as, as a facility to decide on how you would like to go ahead with your baselines okay now we now come to the next question which is question number three which is on water intensive processes or operations The question here is, does your facility know which facility processes or operations use the most water? This, this question, just a second. There is another question here, which is, can we choose baselines as the year we want? For example, we can compare based on our baseline in 2020 instead of 2021. When, when you're choosing your targets and when you're choosing your internal assessments definitely you can choose the baseline that you want but when you're reporting for example for question number six it is the difference between the last year and the the cadence year that you are reporting that you have to actually give the difference of so you can definitely choose whichever is the baseline that you want and there is one more question if any facility is taking their water withdrawal based on estimated parameter is it acceptable to define baseline or they should avoid defining the baseline in level two? Okay, this is here in this case, I would request that if you are taking based on estimated parameter as to what is your water withdrawal, the first instance would be you have, you have a water meter which is installed, which will be able to give you a more accurate figure. and yes estimations are allowed on the platform as of now but it does not mean that you will be able to estimate how much of water you are using without a water meter you will not be in a position to give an estimation accurately and then the verifier would actually come to your site and understand if whatever you are providing is acceptable or not so i hope that answers your question Okay, let's go on with question number three, which is water intensive processes and operations. Does your facility know which facility processes or operations use the most water? And here, the, the main thing is for you to understand or map out all of your production processes together. For instance, with a flow diagram, which will talk to you about or which will give you a clear idea of what is coming from where, what is the usage that is happening, which are the type of machines where you are actually using the, the maximum water. And this, this information you might have if you're having sub meters which are installed, which will give you, okay, in the bleaching area, this is these are different types of machines which are there. And before the machine, you have a you have a meter which will talk to you about, which will help and tell you how much of water usage this particular machine is having. This involves that you have a more detailed insight into the water intensive processes. So you can be a facility which is doing CPB, you can do, be doing e-control, you can be doing plain exhaust tying. So for each of these different types of actions, you would require to understand how are you 
utilizing the water, what is the water usage and which is the department which is having maximum water usage. Uh, I can see one more question here, which is more reliable in baselining water consumption? Is it by versus production volume or by number of working hours and number of people? Yeah, this is a good question here. Thank you for asking this. It, it basically depends on you completely on how you would want to take this. So you will have to decide as to what is the one factor which is affecting your baselines, whether it is the production, is most of your water going into your production or is most of the water actually being used by people. Maybe you are just a cut and sew facility. Maybe then it is the number of the maximum water usages in the sanitation area. Then it is the number of people who will, who will matter to you. But if you are a production intensive facility where you have a number of machines which are utilizing water, the number of people who are there, the sanitation part of it is maybe less than 20% of your total water usage, then it might make sense for you to take your production volume and do your baselining. I hope that answers your question. Thank you for asking that. Let's move forward. Then we have the question on water reduction targets. And the question here is, has your facility set targets for reducing your water usage? And if yes, you would have to select all sources of water for which your facility has set a reduction target. Here again, what we have to understand is that you have to give your reduction as a percentage and you have to give a negative value if you want to show that you're trying to reduce it. And let's say you have rainwater harvesting, which you are doing at your facility, and you want to say that your target is to increase the rainwater harvesting for a particular year, you can say a positive percentage. This is something that we need to understand. And for this question also, in order to get a full score here, you would need to target more than 80% of your consumption when you're setting your goals. And you will receive partial points if you're setting targets for water sources that make up to from 50 to 79% of your total wa water usage, you will get partial points. And let's take a look at uh, when we're talking about water reduction, let's take a look at the hierarchy table that we are able to look at for targeting of water reductions. Uh, they, these are very simple steps that we are able to take to evaluate the water saving opportunities that is there. One of the first questions that you will ask yourself is, can the water use be eliminated at the source? Uh, let's say you have processes which such as laser technology can be used or maybe for a bleaching process you are trying to use ozone technology. So you are then able to reduce the water usage directly at the source. The next question you should ask yourself is, can the amount of water use be reduced? So for if you're looking at water reduction, then it might be, you might have to switch from a high liquor ratio machine to a low liquor ratio machine, perhaps something that is using liquor ratio of about one is to four, for example. So this is how you would then be able to reduce the amount of water use with the help of machines. This is just an example, but these are the questions that we should be asking ourselves for water reductions. And the, ne the next question that we should ask ourselves is, can the water or wastewater be reused and recycled? Uh, here again, you can collect the last rinsing water that is there available for reuse, and or maybe you can have a completely new system or tertiary wastewater treatment system, which you can install with the help of which you will be able to take back a lot of the water that you are throwing out from your facility. Here again, if you have a yes, you can implement the water saving solution. And if no, then you go to the next hierarchy question, which is finally, you have to ensure proper water management practices in for both usage and for disposal. So this is the hierarchy that we would recommend that you follow for water reductions in your facility. And when we're taking formal targets, the formal target should include a baseline performance. 
that is if you're trying to look at a reduction the targeted reduction so you should then write it as minus five percent reduction you should write the expected complete date and ideally it should be relevant to the site's most significant water use Okay, there is one more question. Process produced or processed water refers only to production reused or recycled water can be considered as wastewater treated through STP or domestic treated water and report. Yes, that is correct. So reused, you will have to reuse back into your process water. Then it is referred to as reused. And uh, otherwise, it is basically recycled water that you will have to report. There is one more question. Are the waste from RO water filtration safe for use for hand washing and other external purposes? Yes, it depends on the type of RO membrane that you have. If you have a good membrane, which gives you water with, with good quality, you can use that in your sanitation and other external purposes. And for this, you would require to talk to your, to your water, water recycling agent to understand the type of RO system that you would require to install. Coming back to the water reduction target, some additional information. Here you have to base the target on a formal evaluation of the improvement opportunities and the actions. Perhaps you have discovered that by installing low flow tap, low flow sprays on the, on the taps that are there within the facility, you're going to be able to improve it by a particular level. You should have a formal evaluation. So the person who's actually supplying you this this component will be able to tell by what percentage are you going to be able to reduce the water usage with this installation. So those are the details that you will require to understand. You should define the exact target quantity expressed as a percentage. It should be based on formal evaluation. It could be absolute. It could be normalized as ideally if you're reporting, if you say that you are having baselining and it is an absolute baseline that you are reporting then try i take the target also as an absolute target if you're having normalized baselining then take your target also as a normalized target so there should be a synchronization there define the start date of the baseline define the end date of the target meaning the intended completion date with the required improvements and define what is the appropriate measurement unit that you're going with and establish procedures to review the target. This is important because ideally, when we have set a target, we should be looking at the target every quarter to understand whether we need to make any changes to reach the target that we are looking at. Uh, and finally, ensure that the target is relevant to reducing the site's uh, major water usage. So if you are, if 80% of your water is coming from municipal source, then setting targets only maybe for your well water component will not give you marks. And here you have to ensure that you are setting your target such that you're, you are targeting to reduce the site's major water usage. Okay, there's one more uh, I think it's just a question or it's just a comment here that you have not received the recordings of the session. If not, just send me a mail. I will ensure that you are receiving the recording of the session if your email has been missed for some reason. And sorry for that. Thank you. And yes. Coming back to uh, some targets that we can take, this is an example of how you would be able to set your uh, reduction target. So we have given two examples here. One is where you are installing counter current water recycling systems for your washing. And another is where you're trying to install low flow. If you look at the target and if you look at the detail which has gone in specifying the target, you can see here 
in the first case reduced production water use per square meter of the fabric produced by 15% in 2021 compared to 2019 baseline of 0.5 meter cubed per square meter so this detail of of uh, target setting would be required in order for you to ensure that you are having a continuous kind of an improvement in the facility and also the second one is where you want to reduce lavatory water use per person by 10 percent compared to 2019 baseline of 0.75 meter cubed per person so this is the detail and then of course you can you can put in what is the cost that's required for extra equipment when is the completion date who is actually responsible for this decrease or who will be working on it as as a target etc can be included in your target setting okay and okay thank you lokesh and also thank you aisha i have noted that you will be getting those shortly okay let's come to the implementation plan this is question number five and here the question is does your facility have an implementation plan to improve your water usage here you can answer yes if you have an implementation plan that is in place and it demonstrates that you are taking action to achieve your targeted reductions you can answer also a partial yes here if you have a plan but have not started on all the actions in the plan this is an example of an implementation plan and this is also the template that's provided so the intent of this question is that by maintaining an action plan at your facility you are you are supporting the target settings that you have done you are identifying what are the you or what are the methods with the help of which you're going to be able to bring a reduction in your water use. And coming again to your implementation plan, there are many different examples which we can share. For example, by improving your production efficiency, you will be able to improve your, your water usage. So when we're talking about production efficiency, it could be by eliminating MUDA, it could be by using Kaizen techniques. There are many ways in which you will be able to look at improving production efficiency. You can modernize compressors, boilers, you can upgrade your machines, you can use more sustainable chemicals. There are many different chemicals which are coming in the market, which will help you to, to have optimize your water usage mainly. So that's one way in which you would be able to do it. The other way is also rainwater harvesting because this is a very simple technique with the help of which you will be able to capture the water that is, that is falling within your boundary and then reuse the water. You also have other techniques like ZLD and we also have given examples here of certain projects which you can check out. This is your Sweden Textile Water Initiative and the Clean by Design and the Pact program that's partnership for cleaner textiles all of them have done considerable studies on how you will be able to improve water usage at a facility these are these are again pointers which we would like you to check out for taking up your own initiatives and finally we have i ha i can see two more questions which i will just check out What max overall FEM score achieved in textile sector? So you mean in, in water use, there are many organizations which re receive a complete 100 score in the water use section based on what how they have organized their water management within the facility. I hope that clarifies. And... Question six is on demonstrated improvements. Here, the question is, has your facility reduced your water withdrawal compared with your waste baseline? And you have to select all water sources that have been reduced for, 
uh, for this particular question. And here, what we have to remember is that no matter what is the baseline that you take on the platform, ideally you should report from the previous calendar year as to what is the improvement that you have made. Let's say you have norm absolute values or you have reported absolute values, then you should take your difference in the absolute value and then say this is the improvement that has been seen from your last last year. So it's the year over year improvement which is required for this particular question. And you will receive full points if the reductions have been made in the last calendar year for water sources that make up to 80% of your total water usage. And if let us say you have taken taken or shown improvements for water usage from 50 to 79% of whatever is your total water intake, then you will get partial points. So here again, for question number six, you will have to keep all of the reports on Excel. You will have to show what is the quantity of reduction. What is a percentage change that you have made is also something that you will have to report here. And I ideally, please ensure that you are keeping all of this detail in one single Excel so that you don't have to go from Excel sheet to Excel sheet in order to estimate this information. So there is one more question here. Any calculation tool for calculating the water ev evaporation from open water storage tanks as it is required for water balance? I would, there are many different, different ways in which you would be able to do that. There are online monitoring tools. There are many different ways in which you would be able to understand also the water optimization. But for that, you would have to have a very detailed metering system within your facility so that you are able to understand the usage. Okay. When we talk about question six and when we talk about demonstrated improvements, I would also like to give some do's and don'ts that are important for, for this. We have to review the reduction data to ensure that all aspects are covered and that the information is accurate. We have to enter the improvement quantity as an absolute or as a normalized value. Select the appropriate units for the reduction. So in the units, actually, you do not have an option where you can say the units for a normalized value, but just give the units whatever you have taken, whether it is meter cubed or whether it is the total value that you have taken for your water readings. Input the percentage change in the water use from the source from the previous year. Make sure again to enter a negative percentage for a reduction and a positive percentage for an increase that is there. And you have to also provide sufficient detail in the describe the strategies that were used to achieve this improvement. So let's say most of the water was going into recycling, then you would say that it was it was by recycling or by perhaps implementing a, a, a tertiary filtration system with the help of which you were able to bring in this, these improvements. Okay, there is one more question. Please clear again, water improvement target 80% for full score. It's not clear. All right. So if you have, let us, I'm giving an example here of, let us say that 80, 80 meter cubed of of your water is coming from municipal water, 20 meter cube of your water is coming from well water. So when you are talking about improvement target, you have to then set your target for municipal water that is coming because that makes up 80% of your total water usage. So it is only if you are going to put an improvement target for your municipal water usage that you will get points in your target setting. So I hope that clarifies. That's just a simple example. Then there is another question here. Is the scoring in the HIG given just for filling the data or is it for filling the correct data? So yes, the data should be correct. And that is exactly what the verifier would come and check in that the data is correct. So you should give in the correct information when you're filling in the data. It is not just the 
that is going to give you points. So do you have any table indicating percentage range of the FEM score that is 50 to 70 means partial score, etc. Manza, you would be able to see this on the, on the scoring guidance. There is a link that has been provided in this presentation. So you would be able to see that. Next question is, should facility report improvements against their previous year irrespective of their old baseline? Yes, you should be reporting the improvements against your previous year, not against your baseline year, but against your previous year. Only then will, if you have an improvement in, from, from the last year, only then will you get a score for that question. If it is just from your baseline year, it might, you might not score there. There was one question which I missed. How can we calculate the reduction if the baseline is normalized? So you will be able to still calculate the reduction. You will have to normalize both your previous year data. You will have to normalize your current year data and then take the difference and see if there is an improvement. And then you can report that improvement. I hope that answers your question, Rupa. Okay, I think we have answered all questions. There's one more. How much variation is acceptable in terms of self-assessment versus verification? There is nothing that this is acceptable or this is not acceptable. Whatever is your self-assessment score is based on what you are, what you are able to report on the, on the platform. And let us say that you do want, you have performed a verification and there is a reduction in the score. You you are then basically communicating the new score to all of your stakeholders when you are doing it. Okay, uh, coming to some of the do nots that we have to be mindful of in question number six, do not report improvements that are not accurate. Do not report improvements that were not achieved in the FEM reporting year. Like for example, in 2020, there was there were certain actions which you have taken, you will not then be able to report that in your 2022 FEM. Do not report improvement that is absolute and relates to a decrease in the production or a reduced facility operations. And also do not report an improvement that's based on insufficient data. And coming to how will it be verified? All of the Evidences have to be shown, your calculations, what is the equipment that you have, what, is, what are the changes that you have made. Let's say you have put in a new machine, you would have to indicate as to what is the new machine that has been put in for the improvement. Again, if there are any errors, it will be corrected by the verifier when he is checking this. And we come to the last question, which is on water balance, which is, has your facility implemented a water balance or an, another analysis? to evaluate the traceability of water intake versus the usage. The creation of a full facility water balance, it will provide you insight into the areas with efficiency improvement. What are some of the opportunities that are there? Where are the leaks that are happening? And here you will have to include what is the incoming water um, for your facility, the amount, the sources, the quantity of water used in each of your production steps, what is the quantity of water recycled, reused, what is the quantity of waste water which is generated, and finally, the what, what is the volume of water discharged after your treatments. So all of this will have to be included into your water balance. And plus, there is one more aspect, which is the frequency with which you are checking your water balance information. So all of this information, if it is there, then the water balance can be accepted. And here we give you also some details on how you would be able to create your water balance for yourself. Firstly, you would require to identify and analyze. I understand what are the activities which are happening, what are the machines which have maximum usage, what is the quality of the data that you are able to capture. Create a water balance that is, you have to also understand and exactly are the saving opportunities. You have to compare your data with your 
historical water data and finally create it as effluent as a function of your influent. So your, your influent minus your effluent will be all of your water losses. And if your water loss is less than 15%, then, then it is acceptable. But if it is more than 15%, you would require to investigate and understand from where these losses are happening and how you will be able to address that. And coming to again the uh, example of a of a water balance. This is an example of how you would be able to do a water balance. Here you can see it is actually a ZLD facility here because you're in fact taking back the entire water into your into your process. This is a ZLD facility. You would require to make a diagram and indicate what is from where exactly your water sources are are coming in, your water is actually coming in from the water source, where, which are the utilization areas within the facility where you are actually utilizing the water. If you're treating the water, how are you treating it and taking it back into, let's say you're taking it back into your process, then you will have to show the process. If you're taking it back maybe into STP usage, into maybe gardening, etc., you will have to show that. And that is how you will be able to make your water meter. So we did indicate as to what are the steps that are there required for your water balance to be accepted. So please do check on that information correctly. And yeah, I have some more questions here. I started the HIG last 2020. Is it necessary to use 2020 data as baseline for 2022 HIG FEM? It is not required to use 2020 data. If you want to change that, depending on, let's say there have been changes in your facility, then you can go in for a new baseline year also. So for each cadence, it is up to you to decide as to what is the baseline year you want to take. Will any Higgs code be given if the facility has not verified by any verifier? You will, have, of course, have your self-assessment score. Even if you don't have your verification done, you will have your self-assessment score. The next question is, we have improved from baseline, but increased water or energy consumption from last year due to low production because of market conditions. Then in that case, also our score will reduce. That is correct. You are in question six, when we are asked, when the platform is asking you for improvements, they check it very specifically against year on year improvements. So you have to check both your normalized as well as absolute values to see if you are able to report any type of improvement. And if you're not able to report, then unfortunately you will not be able to score there. The next question is if the data is filled, but the verifier has checked and found that it is incorrect, will any score be given in that case? Yes, of course. It is once the data is corrected and input into the platform, you will get the score for that. It is only that the data is corrected. It is not that you will lose any score for for that particular action. And last question here is, can the water balance be calculated even though there is no wastewater discharge flow meter? Ideally, see, when you want to have a water balance, you should know how you are, you are arriving at your water balance, water balance formulas, etc. So here, when you don't have a wastewater discharge, perhaps you're doing an estimation and saying, 80% uh, of your total water consumption is, is being discharged into wastewater. You would then be able to make the, make the water balance accordingly, but ideally you should ensure that there is a discharge flow meter that is also uh, there, which will be able to give you accurate values. Okay, coming down to an example, we would highly recommend that you, you go with pie chart with the help of which you would be able to talk about which are the different sections within your organization where you have water usage and how it is used. And we have here given you examples also of the NRDC best practices for textile mills. This is a great example of how you would be able to improve on your water usage. You have, you have different leak detections, which, you will, which will give you considerable savings. 
you can find the link here in this particular slide. I would highly recommend that you go and check it out. If you look at, if you look at how you would be able to improve it, there are many different ways in which you are able to optimize your water usage. According to NRDC, a mill that has implemented all of these be best practices would have a would be able to save about 27 to 37 tons of water per ton of production based on whatever are the mills that they have worked with. So that is about 13 to 24 percent of the total water usage has been has been optimized for these different units. This is something that I would highly recommend that you do visit that and get inspired to install certain certain actions which will help you to save water and finally one one last example of how you would be able to save some water this is a link that that is very interesting of how a unit has actually they have been able to save a considerable amount of water this is a denim factory I would definitely request that you check it out once you receive the link. And I go back to my questions here. In the water balance question, partial yes is available. So there are requirements to be fulfilled for partial bal water balance. Yes, this is also available and you can check this out also in the how to HIG guide the score that will come after the verifier assessment be different from self assessment it depends on if your if all of your answers are accurate then basically you will get the same score but if there are if there are some questions which are inaccurate the verifier will correct them so your score can either increase or it can decrease so both options are there and if a facility deliberately put wrong data controlled number instead of actual numbers as baseline in the system and verifier somehow got to the bottom of it, what would be the impact on of this malpractice? So see, basically the FEM platform is trying to uh, give you accurate data, so which you will be able to share with your, with your stakeholders. So the verifier is not going to be looking at how they will be able to impact the malpractice, etc. The verifier is only responsible for putting in accurate numbers. And if the number is wrong, then basically the verifier would, would check and put in the right numbers. So I hope those answer your questions. And all right. And there is one, one question on last slide, please. This is, you will get all of the slides here. Up, so you would be able to see that. This is the slide on saving. This is a YouTube video which we would recommend that you watch out. It is very interesting of how a unit has managed to save a million tons of water. Okay, I think we have answered all of the questions. And before we wind up, I would like to give a small brief about our team. We have we have a large team in place in many areas and we would be very happy to partner with you for your HIG FEM verifications and clarify any kind of questions that you have for your, for your facilities as you fill in also your self-assessments. And this are our set of webinar series that we are doing. We have covered section one, two, and three, and today we have covered four. I have given also a link to the recordings that are there of the previous section, so you will not miss any of them. And I look forward to seeing all of you in our coming upcoming webinars. We have the next section coming up on Monday already, and I hope I will be able to see you there as well. Yes, of course, all of the links will be there in both the presentation as well as you will be receiving a copy of it. So that should be fine.
Okay, there is a question on please explain water balance once again. You would be able to see this Asad in in the recording and if not you can please connect with me my mail address will be there with you i'll be happy to help you how are verifiers appointed do we reach them personally or sac appoints me, appoints them so it the verifiers are all attached to a verifying body so we are all attached to leadership and sustainability so there are many different verification bodies the verification body basically grooms trains the verifier so we also have calibration trainings which we are expected to undertake and so it is not sac who appoints them it is a verifier body have the verifiers and the verifiers basically qualify for the verifications so i guess that answers all our questions for today i am sorry that we have we have overshoot our time apologize for that i will try and keep this to one hour next time see you in our next presentation and i look forward to having a good session with all of you thank you bye bye Bye. Thank you.